When I began, when I first stepped on stage as a comedian, I really had no idea if I was funny or not. I mean, none. I wanted to be funny, but I didn't know if I had any talent at all, any different from anybody else, that, that people should be even listening to me. I had zero um, uh, self-awareness of having any ability in the comedic arts, zero. So to get up and just talk into a microphone, I felt so insane and outrageous that I would think this of myself, that people, because the first thing you have to think is, people should listen to me. That's the first thought you have to have. And I really didn't have much confidence in that. And I had this bit that I wrote about being left-handed. This was one of the first comedy things that I ever wrote. And uh, the, 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 the bit was, uh, I'm left-handed and I don't understand why everything that's, that's associated with the word left is, seems to be a negative thing. Two left feet, um, left-handed compliment, you go to a party, there's nobody there, where'd everybody go? They left. And this got a huge laugh. And I was so shocked, I was just shocked. I was shocked. I just, I heard this laugh just hit me like a bucket of water in the face. That's what it felt like. And I, and I was stunned and I, and I froze and I didn't know what to say next and I couldn't believe, it would be, it's like, you know, if you're going, it's 1850 and you're going to go to California, you're going to decide, I'm going to go pan for gold. I'm going to go out and see if there's gold in them Nar Hills in California. And you go, and your first day, you lift up a rock, and there's a giant rock of gold, you know. You would just go, you would freeze. So I remember the feeling of surprise and shock and complete, I was completely discombobulated from that point. I didn't know what to do, because I couldn't believe I had found what I was looking for. I had no confidence that I had any gift for this. It's like if, it's like if you said, well, I want to I want to I want to be a painter. I want to paint oil paintings. I mean, you've never picked up a brush, you know, so you go to the art store and you get the canvas and you get the easel and you get the paints and you dip the brush in the paint and you start putting it on there. I, I had no, I mean, it was exactly like that for me. I have no idea. Can I paint? I don't know. I'm going to try and paint. I want to be a painter. I didn't, I really had no belief that I think I have something. I just wanted to do it. Well, I, I did okay. I did okay. The first time I got on stage, I did okay. And I, I realized at that point that I had some ability to do it. And once I knew I had some ability, I did not care if my life was going to be a absolutely minimal hand-to-mouth existence of just um, barely, barely getting by. Barely. I didn't care. I go, I, w I want to be in this life. And this is really the key aspect of a comedian, is that you want to be this, and you don't care about anything else. And I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure most great athletes, and people that, or, or uh, maybe, I'm sure every person that gets to become president, they have their first taste of this world and this life, and they just go, I, I want to be that. And you don't care about anything else. I never, and I, and, and really for a large part of my adult life, I didn't. Well, working on comedies, I, I'm still doing it, you know, and I'm doing the exact same thing from day one. It's just this long, laborious, um, excruciating process of, you know, looking for things. Well, precision is a big part of comedy, but all comedians are precise, all of them.
and how they may have a different process of getting to it. Um, you know, Don Rickles doesn't have a set list of subjects he's going to talk about, but everything he does, every thing that he says that gets a laugh is precise or it wouldn't get a laugh. There's really not much sloppy good comedy. It, it almost doesn't exist. So you may get it, you may come to it in different ways, but all comedians are precise. It's everything. It, yes, I, I like to write ideas out on paper. I like to just ad-lib them on stage. I like to listen to a tape of what I just said. And, you know, and then you have to be the uh, kind of a jewelry maker and think, well, what do I do with this now? Where do I cut the diamond next, you know? Well, I mean, I know this bit about golf and um, how when it gets to the end of the big tournament uh, and the, 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 the pressure putt, I'm kind of obsessing on the moment of the pressure putt and the golfer and how he's acting and the announcers and the whispering. And they, they whisper, you know. And um, I had this thing that I, from my notebook from like four years earlier that for some reason when people talk about tipping, they whisper it like it's illegal. Did you tip the guy? What are you supposed to tip? How much do you tip? Did you tip? Should I tip? Did you tip? Do we both tip? You know, for some reason, it's like a drug deal. So uh, as I was working on this golf thing and the announcer was whispering, I think, what do I do with that? And I went, oh, I have a thing in my notebook about tipping, whispers. And and then, I, and then there was another thing about that whenever people say about someone being black, the word a black person, they, let, they, have, they, want, to, they want to whisper that. They go, what do I talk, talk to the black guy? Ask the black guy. He, he's in charge. So then, so, so then you, you say, oh, there's something there. There's something there. So now I make a, uh, now we make what's called a charm bracelet out of it. You take these things and you find a way to associate them. So that's, that's the process, you know. Now that I'm doing this thing about golf and then the tipping thing from four years ago. Why do people whisper when they tip? So then you go, oh, there's something there. Let me connect those two things. And of course it comes out like I had thought of all of this at the same time, but I, but I didn't. I started out from the very beginning. I, I like to jot down an idea and then I like to sit and explore it on paper and then I'll just go on stage and do whatever comes out and it's just like it's 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 back and forth back and forth comedy is tough at first nothing is not tough at first nothing but the if you have the gene and you hear that laugh as I did that night when you hear that thing that you really love then, then you're hooked, you know? And I'm, I don't imagine it's different from any other type of addiction, only in this case I see it's a positive addiction. You were, and you just go, well, I'm, I'm willing to work to get more of those. I will work. So it um, just takes a lot of work. It's really, let, let me put it this way. It's not hard to get a laugh. It's not hard to get a laugh. It's hard to get a laugh at 8 o'clock on Tuesday because that's when the show is. That's what's hard. A lot of people say funny things all the time and get big laughs. Everyone has gotten a laugh, almost, you know, and socially and wherever. The hard part is doing it at a time and place of someone else's choosing. That's the profession, and that takes many, many, many years. I remember the first time I had like a great set, you know, and everything worked. And I came off stage and I thought, I got it. I thought I have it. Oh, I, know how to, I know how to do this now. But the next night, the circumstances are all changed. To different rooms, different audience, different, everything's different. So you have to learn to calculate all those. What's changed and how do I um, 
as they say in baseball, make adjustments. Yes, everything's adjusted every night. And it's, sometimes it's a, only a small amount, but it's, it's what makes the difference. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, baseball analogies, and you can tell me if I'm doing too many of them, but when they find you can hit a certain pitch, they don't throw you that pitch. You know, now you have to learn to hit what they're throwing you. It's still swinging a, a bat at a ball. You would say, well, that's the same. He's doing the same thing, but he's, they're not giving you the same thing, and you're not doing the same thing. Well, uh, when I started in the late 70s, early 80s, that there was a very clear hierarchy of what was the biggest deal, and it was Carson. So to get asked to be on that show was like, do you want to play in the World Series? And of course you say yes, but if you don't do well, you're, you're not going to be on the team. Again, another baseball analogy, that's two. It went well. It went well. I had had a different image of it in my mind. Um, I had never been in front of 500 people before. And, uh, you know, that was the biggest audience I had ever seen at that time. So I, I was nervous for a million reasons, but that was very overwhelming to me. I had never been on stage without a microphone. You know, you're just, you know, which is uh, helpful to a comedian, have something to hold on to. Uh, so um, it went well, but it didn't go, you know, crazy. It wasn't amazing. It was just well. It was well enough to get asked back, and, and then um, I went on from there. He was very, very supportive to me from the very beginning. And uh, you're so in shock at the time. You know, you, you, you're, you just feel like a deer that's getting shot at. That, that's how you feel. <laughs> that it wasn't until, I don't know, maybe might have been years later that I watched the tape and I saw how supportive he, he, he was saying, great job, Jerry, you know, as I left. And he gives you the big OK sign, you know, which was a very valuable thing. That I realized, oh, he liked me. You know, he liked what I was doing. Well, uh, now let's go back to the fall of uh, 1988. Um, the comedy boom, which began in the 70s, and those comedians that began in the late 70s, seven, eight years, nine years later, they were good. There was a lot of them, and they were good. And so comedy clubs began to spring up because they're very cheap. Comedians were very cheap. You could get a comedian to come and play at your club every night for $500. And audiences would come in, and you'd have rooms of 200, 250 people full. Uh, paying cover charges, buying drinks, buying food, and everybody was thrilled. The comedians were thrilled, the club owners were thrilled, and there was a giant comedy boom. And um, because before that, you know, it was really just a ha small handful. George Carlin, Robert Klein, Richard Pryor, Lily Tomlin, Steve Martin. There were, that was about it. You know, there were just a few youngish people doing comedy which spawned my generation, which was much larger. There was maybe 50 or 60 people that were good. They could do 45 minutes, they could do an hour, and then they were good. So that led to that boom. So I, when NBC said to me, if you ever, it, which it was initiated by my manager, George Shapiro, who wrote a letter to the president of NBC, which said, it was one line. It said, call me a crazy guy, but I have a feeling someday Jerry Seinfeld is going to be doing a series on NBC. So they called me in, and they said, what is it that you have in mind? And I said, nothing. I, I don't have any, didn't have anything in mind. I actually believed maybe they had something in mind. Since they had the big building with the logo on it, I thought maybe that's what they do here. Maybe they come up with TV shows, and they take talented people, and say, we have a show for you. But they don't do that. They don't do that. So anyway, so I had that meeting. And then I was in New York about a month later. And I was talking with Larry David in the bar of a comedy club. 
And I said, so I had this meeting at NBC. And uh, they asked me, you know, what kind of a show would you like to do? And I said, I don't, I don't have any ideas. And uh, when we left the club and we went across the street to a Korean deli to get a snack. And we were standing at the cash register and they got all those weird things in the Korean delis at the cash register. You know, just uh, unlabeled Fig Newtons and small red bottles with Chinese writing on it. And, you know, that, and we started making jokes about that. And he said, this is what the show should be. Two comedians just hanging out with nothing to do. And that was the beginning of the show. We weren't quite sure. I mean, any, any pilot is, say, a, a, a real shot in the dark, a real just close your eyes and throw your dart at the board and just hope to hell you hit something. And that's any TV pilot and, and most movies. Um, so, uh, and I was very uncomfortable you know, it was, it, was a, it was a big opportunity to do my own situation comedy. That was a very big opportunity. And I think I wasn't quite sure who to be or how to be. You know, I knew, I figured out pretty early on that my best chance of success was to kind of be the way I had always been on stage. So I said, I'm not going to be a character. I'm going to be just me as a comedian. And this is my life, you know, which is all made up, but it'll have a reflection of what my life was in New York in my early days. That was the, the premise. A hundred percent. There's nothing pretty much that TV Jerry would do that I wouldn't do and vice versa. And who cares anyway? <laughs> it's just, you know, just be, you got to come up with a funny story and have people saying funny things. The sh whole show came from the way Larry and I related. And that's why I asked him to work with me on it, because I liked the sound of the conversations that he and I would have. And he had a lot more ideas than I had about what we should do and shouldn't do. So he really helped structure the whole thing. And then when we got to the dialogue of the scenes, um, he and I would just talk, and we would just write it down. No, at that time, he wasn't really interested in acting. No, we never talked about that. I don't think he had any interest in that. Um, you know, running a show is a big job. I mean, it was, uh, it was difficult for me to be doing all the rehearsals and all the writing sessions and the casting and editing sessions. I mean, it's just a lot of hours of things. So if we were both on stage all day, it would have been impossible. So he was able to run the writing staff and the production team, and you know, there's a lot of things that go into making a TV show. To tell you the truth, when I think back on the show, some of my favorite moments were me and Larry in the room writing, um, even more than on camera because the discovery of something funny is really more exciting than the delivering of it. They're, they're both, they're different things, but I really loved um, when uh, George was pretending to be a marine biologist and Kramer was hitting golf balls on the beach and George found the golf ball in the blowhole of the whale. That moment First of all, we were doing those stories before we saw that there was a connection between them. That what if the distress of the whale was caused by Kramer's golf ball? We were way, way deep into making that show. We might not have even noticed it. It just, somebody went, wait, 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 wait a minute. What if, what if that's what the whale's problem was? And then, of course, then we, and it was the night before that Larry and I wrote George's um, tale of, of, what are the fish story, I guess you'd call it. The sea was angry that, uh, that day, my friends. And we wrote that the night before and just laughed ourselves silly writing that. Um, <laughs> but that, that's about my most favorite thing that we ever stumbled upon. There, there were lots of, 
lots of them that I loved, but uh, if you're going to ask me for one favorite thing. Well, there's nothing funny about being good at it. People being disrespectful to me just always seemed funny, you know. I was never, you know, trying to project an image of myself being this great comedian, because that, that's not funny. What's funny is your friends don't think you're so funny and you're a professional comedian. That's funny. People talk about the lessons or, you know, what is this episode about or is there anything we can learn from that story we just watched. And as, as a person in comedy, you have to understand it, it's, like, it, it's like you're talking to a, a, a GI in World War II and I'm firing at the enemy and I'm getting fired upon and you come up with a microphone and going, what are you learning from this? And you go, what? Learning? I got no time for, for you or for learning, you know. They're shooting at me. And I'm trying to shoot back. Larry Miller uh, has a great story that I love about, um, this is a little extreme, but uh, it's the same, along the same lines. And uh, I, sometimes I would ask him about, you know, uh, anti-Semitism. You know, we're both Jewish. And I would say, well, what is, where is it? Why is it? Why does it exist? Where does it come from? You know, and he once said to me, he says, it's like, you know, when the Nazis are herding you into the gas chamber, so you want to ask the, the, the guard, hey, is there a problem here? What is the problem? Irrelevant. <laughs> Irrelevant. So you ask me about the stories of comedy or lessons or... Irrelevant. The, the, in comedy, we try to get laughs because that's how we survive. Nobody wants to hear somebody just talk. I mean, unless you're paying for a seminar and it's a subject you want to learn about. Nobody wants to hear somebody talk. When you're talking, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day, talking to a, a civilian person, a non-comedy person, and they were saying, boy, the audience will turn on you pretty quick if you're not doing well in comedy. They go, I know that. I go, they should turn on you. You're completely occupying them. You better be doing something of value. Or they should turn on you. It should be like, you know, Frankenstein with the villagers. If you're going to dominate this whole room, it better be good. <laughs> yeah, but that's really, what you're talking about is television as a medium, not my show in particular. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day that told me when they moved to New York, they moved to the Upper West Side because on the show, that's where I seemed to be dating all these young pretty girls and I lived on the Upper West Side, so that seemed like the thing to do. Well, that's not what the Upper West Side is like. You know, it's a lot of old people. <laughs> it's not swinging. It's not cool. You know, so he saw that on TV. That just shows you the power of TV. Just because it's funny, they think it's right or makes sense or has influence. Funny makes things seem right. You know, even if there's absolutely no basis in it, even if it's completely wrong, as it was in this case. Anything, that's why people try and work jokes into their speeches. It makes the person seem right. Because funny is smart, for the most part. It's pretty hard to be funny and a complete moron. That's pretty hard to do. You have to be a genius, but a complete moron is really going to struggle with comedy. That is one of my favorite lines of the show. When I say to George, you know, if everything you do is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. Which is completely stupid, you know. But he's stupid, so he believes it, you know. It sounded good, you know. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what I love about that, is that that's an eternal comedic device. Two idiots trying to work something out, you know. That's Laurel and Hardy. That's Abbott and Costello. That, that is an ancient 
comedic device. If two guys are stupid, watching them try and be smart is going to be funny. Word precision. Uh, Abbott and Costello had tremendous word precision, and I responded to that, and I loved that, and I wanted to be like that. I do have other things now that are important to me. I think I would have struggled with having other things that are important to me in the early part of my career. Um, relationships, other than friendships with other comedians, were very expendable to me, you know, until I got married, frankly. <laughs> When I got married, it was the first time I really cared about anything other than comedy. That I thought, okay, now I'm... And luckily, and that's the way it worked out, and I guess maybe it, that's why it worked out that way, is um, I had pretty much gotten where I wanted to go. I had finished the TV series and, you know, I had, you know, gotten somewhere. So I was... Then, for the first moment of my life, I was like, okay, what else is there to being a human being? Wasn't really interested in much else. Oh, it's not an enjoy. It's like, it's a life. It's, it's not a job. It's a life. It's just like, I want this life. You know, I want, to, I want my life to be about this thing. And so that's why you're, you don't really think about why do I do this. It's just, this is what I do. It's like, fish, I'm going to swim, you know. I have to say that was always somewhat of an application of knowledge from another field, you know, the other field being stand-up comedy and com comedic knowledge in general that I had acquired. Uh, now I'm going to apply it to a network sitcom. That's what that was. Um, but, as you can see, uh, if you look at my career since then, it wasn't like, this is what I really want to do. It wasn't that. It was something else I was going to attempt to do, something I thought would be cool to do, fun to do, great to do, for lots of reasons, but I could have just completely left. Excuse me. I could have just completely left the life of stand-up at that point. Could have just become a filmmaker or an actor or just gone into that world of that show business. But first of all, it's pretty hard to follow that show. Once you've had that kind of experience, you don't want to have a lesser version of that. You know what I mean? You don't want to have dessert and then the meatloaf. <laughs> it's just not a good progression, you know. So having done that show, I was kind of spoiled. And it's like, well, I don't want to do some crummy movie or some lame romantic comedy thing or anything else that I may have been um, able to get people would let me do, you know. That show was such a peaking moment of, I'm playing myself on my own show and a show and it's that people like, you know, it was kind of like I was very satisfied. I was just, oh, so that's what that's like. And I like that life. There's more than just the show, too. It's the whole life, you know, of not having to go anywhere in the morning, you know. <laughs> and... I couldn't, and those, all, all these things, is, they take so much work and application of effort. They're so difficult, so challenging. And um, I just, I, I don't think I wanted to do something that difficult again. I did find it difficult. You know, I mean, we, we, we killed ourselves to make those shows as good as they were. They weren't, we weren't just hanging around, you know. People always say, why don't you do another sitcom? And I think, if I could do another sitcom that good, yeah, sure, sure I'd do it. You can't. I mean, I can't. It's every time you, you 
come up with a joke, it's a miracle. And then you got to expand it out, come up with an idea for a sitcom that runs for multiple years, that's good every week. It's, it, you know what, it's just like, it's playing ball. It's like you're, you're out there on the field. You know, it's like you're getting the actual laugh right there. You're going, I think if I say this like this, I think it would be funny. If I talk about this thing, and I talk about it like this, and I say this, I think that would be funny. And so, you, so that's what you think, and then you do it, and then it's, you hear the laugh, it's like, oh, well, there it is, you know. That was funny, or it wasn't funny, but it's so, uh, there's no other art of any kind so completely, so closely connected to the recipients of the art and the artist himself. There's nothing you can name. Um, singing, poetry, painting, music. When you say something and the laugh is right there, it's right there, you know, just a second after you say it, a fraction of a second, it's that tightly, you're so tightly connected to the public at large, just the mass public. Everybody else makes things, and then you have some version of it, and then it goes out there through a medium. It's, it's just not as, um, I don't know how to express it. It's, it's the shortness of the wire. That's what it is. It's a short wire between the end of a joke and a laugh. It almost doesn't exist. There really is, almost isn't even a split second between them. But think of the amount of time between thinking of an idea for a movie and when that audience laughs at that movie and you're not even there when it happens. So that's why those things didn't draw me away. Because they seem more distant and more muted and, and less, less exciting. Well, the difference between a stand-up and, and a sitcom is you're going from the least collaborative medium there is to the most collaborative. There's probably more people working on a TV show than even a movie on a week-to-week -week basis. You have 100 people every week that we're all going to do this together, 100 of us, <laughs> you know, and that's very different from one. And, um, but it still comes down to, it would come down to, uh, th that TV show was, was Larry and me and our sensibility of what are we going to do. And even he and I didn't agree sometimes, but we worked very well together. And nobody else's opinion really mattered. And everybody knew that's how this works. I mean, it does work. It works the best because that's a voice. That show is those two guys, you know. So, um, it was like, you know, being a comedian is, um, let, let's use the par uh, a parade analogy. There's the, there's the, what are they called? The drum major is the one with the stick at the front with the hat and he sticks his legs up. Okay, well, a comedian, you're doing that. You're that guy, you're one guy. But then when you do a sitcom, now there's a parade behind me, you know. But it's still, they're still just going to laugh at that one guy. But we got a lot of other stuff going on. <laughs> so it's, it's, the diff it's different, but it's the same, and that's why I was able to do it and why so many comedians can do it. I, I should take out so many because there's not so many. Very difficult. Very difficult. Because the reason you become a comedian is you're not a good collaborator. You're not good with people. You're not good in social things, situations or professional situations. You're not really good at anything but that. So then all of a sudden you throw this guy into this, this corporation. It's a corporation. That's what a, a, a sitcom production team is. And now you're in charge of this corporation. This guy, he doesn't have that skill set. He hasn't trained for that. He doesn't know the first thing about it. Barely knows, barely knows how to talk to people. 
So that's the real challenge of it is you're either lucky enough to hook up with somebody that does know how to do it and does it for you or you're somehow able to learn it, which is in my case, is I learned it. I learned how to run things, how to, how to, how to be a boss. What does a comedian know about being a boss? That's what you are. And if you have your own TV show, you're the boss. And being boss is a, that's a big skill set. So there was, it's just a ton to learn and you don't have much time. You know, because if the show's not good, they're not, they're not, it's not going to survive. 